many Magic the Gathering players asked the question, how do I draft Phyrexia All Will Be One? Drafting a new set can be intimidating for many Magic the Gathering players. Unlike evaluating a new set for Commander or one of the several constructed formats where only a small subset of the new cards are clearly strong enough to make the cut, many cards that aren't good enough in constructed are all-stars and limited. In fact, the vast majority of cards in a given set have at least some role to play in their corresponding limited environment. But with so many cards to choose from among the packs going around a draft table, knowing where to even begin can be so daunting that many Magic the Gathering players simply avoid dipping their toes in the format at all. But the truth is nobody knows exactly what a limited format will look like until people start playing it more. And while there are always some cards that are clearly good on paper, many cards fly under the radar for weeks before players realize their strength. This video will provide baseline information for you to take into your first draft of Phyrexia All Will Be One. It will lay out a rough outline of what draft decks from one should look like, including key cards to take and build around if you see them going around the table. It'll also highlight the available mana fixing, combat tricks, and a few noteworthy bombs that you should not pass if you see them. The goal of this video is to give you the confidence to show up at a Phyrexia All Will Be One draft at your local game store's Friday Night Magic, even if you are someone who doesn't normally draft sets. If you are not familiar with draft at all, you can watch my introductory video on how to draft, but this video will assume you know the basics of a draft and focus on how to draft Phyrexia All Will Be One. Let's begin with... Part one, mechanics. Let's begin by covering the various strengths and strategies relating to the mechanics of Phyrexia All Will Be One. Toxic. Toxic is this set's fixed version of Infect. It still gives poison counters, but at a much slower rate than Infect creatures did. Toxic also isn't boosted by pump spells the way Infect was, and therefore it should be a less oppressive way to play with poison. Corrupted. Corrupted is a payoff for poison counters. Cards with the corrupted mechanic get better when your opponent has three or more poison counters. You'll need to pair these cards with toxic creatures or find other ways to give your opponent poison. Oil counters. Oil counters are the other major counter in the set. These function the same as any other specialty counter, such as charge counters, where the counter themselves has no inherent functionality. Cards that get oil counters generally have effects that require a certain number of oil counters. The only difference between these counters and other specialty counters is that they're Phyrexian oil flavored. Yum. Proliferate. Proliferate is a returning mechanic. When you proliferate, you may choose any number of permanents and players that have counters and add one to each. In this set, there are three counters, poison, oil, and loyalty. Note that there are no plus one plus one counters in Phyrexia All Will Be One. This was an intentional choice by the design team to keep the limited environment from becoming too confusing. For Mirrodin, the last set mechanic in one is for Mirrodin. This is a similar mechanic to Living Weapon from our last venture into new Phyrexia. But instead of creating a 0-0 germ token, the equipment for Formiridin creates a 2-2 rebel token when they enter, then equips to the token. That means that unlike with germ tokens, you can move your equipment from your 2-2 rebel to a different creature and not instantly lose your token to state-based actions. Let's talk about the different color pairs of the set and some cards to watch out for when building each one. In contemporary draft formats, Wizards of the Coast tends to put gold uncommons in each set that guide you towards the archetypes they've designed for the format. These are known as signpost uncommons, and getting a feel for these cards can make you better prepared to build a cohesive deck at your first draft of a new limited format. Now, I wouldn't recommend first picking these cards necessarily, although you certainly can. The best strategy, however, is when drafting, try sticking to one color so you can remain open throughout the draft to choosing a second color once you see what colors feel open. 
When you first pick a signpost uncommon, you're committing yourself to two colors, which would come back to bite you if that particular color pair doesn't wind up being open. Still, keeping an eye on when these signpost uncommons are showing up fourth or fifth pick of a pack will give you a sense that the archetype is open. And once you have drafted one of these cards, I recommend you start building around them in earnest. Part two, archetypes. In green-white, the archetype is Toxic Corrupted. The green-white deck centers around attacking with toxic creatures. The signpost uncommon for the archetype is Slaughter Singer, a 2-2 Phyrexian Cleric for one green and one white mana. Slaughter Singer has Toxic 2 and provides a boost to your other creatures with Toxic when they attack, making it easier to get into the combat trenches in the clogged board states that are so common and limited. Green cards for this archetype tend to be large creatures that are backed up with hefty toxic abilities, whereas your white cards will be smaller with less devastating toxic numbers. You can also boost your deck by dipping into the pool of corrupted cards, which get better once your opponent has three or more poison counters. The green-red deck is built around oil counters, and specifically around removing oil counters from your creatures to get beneficial effects. The signpost uncommon for this archetype is Cinder Slash Ravager, a 5-5 Phyrexian warrior with vigilance for four generic and one of each green and red mana. Cinder Slash Ravager effectively has affinity for creatures with oil counters, and when it enters the battlefield, it pings each of your opponent's creatures for one damage. This is an interesting card in the green-red deck, because it rewards you for having oil counters on your creatures, whereas the archetype itself asks you to remove oil counters from your creatures in order to activate their abilities. If you have a Ravager in your hand, it'll often be better to hold off on activating your oily creatures' abilities until after you've played out your Ravager. The red-black deck centers around sacrificing artifacts and creatures for value. The signpost uncommon is Charforger, a powerful 2-3 Phyrexian beast for one generic and one of each red-black mana. When this enters the battlefield, it makes a 1-1 Phyrexian goblin token, meaning the total power and toughness that Charforger adds to the board for three mana is 3-4. Whenever a creature or artifact you control hits the graveyard from the battlefield, including tokens, Charforger gets an oil counter. You can remove three oil counters from Charforger to exile the top card of your library, which you may then play this turn. Charforger is a great card in a sacrifice deck. It provides fodder for your sack outlets and provides a card advantage engine so you can refuel with more fodder as you deplete your own resources. The blue-black deck's theme is a bit less cohesive than some of the other color pairs. Ostensibly, this archetype will focus on proliferating and graveyard recursion. But looking at the blue and black cards available, I think blue-black decks in this set will generally be control decks with a lot of value permanence. The signpost uncommon is Voidwing Hybrid, a 2-1 flyer for a blue and a black mana. Voidwing Hybrid has Toxic 1, and whenever you proliferate it, you return Hybrid from your graveyard to your hand. There's plentiful good removal in this color combination and a fair amount of card advantage. Just make sure you draft enough creatures that can win the game. Blue-white is an artifact color pair in this set. Its signpost uncommon is Cephalopod Sentry, a four-mana flyer with five toughness and power equal to the number of artifacts you control. The Sentry is itself an artifact, so at minimum this will be a 1-5 on the battlefield. But if you make sure to fill your deck with artifacts, and especially other artifact creatures, this Sentry will get real big real fast. White-black is all about corruption, and by extension, poison counters. The signpost uncommon is an absolute heater, if your opponent has three or more poison counters, that is. Vivisection Evangelist is a 4-4 Vigilant Phyrexian Cleric for three generic, one white, and one black mana. Vivisection Evangelist has Corrupted. When it enters play, if your opponent has three or more poison counters, destroy target creature or planeswalker your opponent controls. To put this card in perspective, Ravenous Chupacabra in Rivals of Ixalan Limited was a beating, and that was just a 4-mana 2-2 after the Enter the Battlefield dust settled. For one more mana, Evangelist has a better Enter the Battlefield effect and is still a 4-4 Vigilance creature on top of it all. Of course, this card only gets great if you can turn on Corrupted, so make sure your white-black deck has plenty of Toxic and other ways of poisoning your opponent. 
Another toxic deck in this set's limited environment is the Black Green deck. This deck's signpost uncommon is Necrogen Rot Priest, a 4 mana 1 5 Phyrexian Zombie Cleric in Golgari colors. The Rot Priest has Toxic 2 and an ability that grants a creature you control with Toxic Death Touch. And if you ever hit your opponent with a creature with Toxic while the Rot Priest is in play, they receive an extra poison counter. The plan for this deck is clear draft a bunch of creatures with Toxic, back them up up with some removal and maybe a bit of recursion, and get feisty in combat, punishing blocks from your opponent by giving your creatures death touch. The blue-green deck is built around proliferating. The signpost uncommon is Tainted Observer, a terrifying Phyrexian bird uh, thing. It's a 2-3 flyer for 3 mana in Simic colors. Tainted Observer has Toxic 1 and can proliferate whenever a creature enters play. In order to make the most out of your proliferating, you'll need to make sure to have plenty of cards that generate counters. Planeswalkers are particularly good in a base Simic deck. The blue-red deck in this set is, as it often is, a non-creature spells matter deck. The twist with the deck this time around, however, is your non-creature spells generate oil counters, which you can then cash in for beneficial effects similar to the green-red deck. The signpost uncommon is Serum Core Chimera, a 4-mana 2-4 Phyrexian Chimera with flying. Like many cards in this archetype, Serum Core Chimera gets an oil counter every time you cast a non creature spell. Remove three oil counters from Serum Core Chimera to draw a card. Then you may discard an on-land card to deal three damage to a creature or planeswalker. This Chimera is awesome. It doesn't hit hard, but it's a great blocker, meaning it can hold down the fort while you generate value off your non-creature spells. And it can help you clear a messy board over a couple of turn cycles. Even though this is a non-creature spells matter archetype, don't skimp out on drafting creatures. Your deck should have roughly 10 to 12 creatures when you finish drafting your deck. As is often the case, the red-white archetype for this set is an aggressive equipment deck. The signpost uncommon is Bladehold War Whip, an equipment with Formiridin. Bladehold War Whip gives the equipped creature double strike and makes your other equipment cheaper to equip. The common issue with equipment in Limited has always been that it takes up a slot in your deck without providing a body, but this deck mitigates that issue by giving you a 2-2 creature. As a result, when constructing your draft deck, you can count any equipment that has for Mirrodin as a creature. Part 3. Mana. Let's talk mana fixing. Building a good mana base can be tricky in a draft deck. Generally speaking, it's safest to stick to just two colors when drafting a deck. Some formats make splashing a third color easier by having a cycle of dual lands at common. This format does not. The common land cycle are single colored tap lands that can be sacrificed to draw a card. What this format does have in the way of mana fixing is a range of colorless mana fixers, including the beloved limited card Prophetic Prism, a couple of artifacts that tap to add a mana of any color, an artifact creature that can search up a basic to put on top of your deck, a single mana fixing land at common, and a cycle of rare dual lands that you absolutely positively should not rely on, or even pick highly if you see them. There's also a notable exception to the mana problem. If your deck is base green, all of a sudden it becomes easy to splash additional colors thanks to the high number of green cards that can fix your mana. It will be much more common for your green deck to play three or possibly even four colors than it will for any deck that doesn't contain green. Be careful to only attempt this if you are already base green. A good rule of thumb to follow is never splash for mana fixing. If you need to already have access to mana of your splash color in order to cast your fixing, then it is not fixing, and it's going to make your deck worse. Prophetic Prism is the best mana fixer in the set, as it is colorless and replaces itself upon entering the battlefield, and it can be used to splash for powerful bombs that you may have opened or been passed too late to build your deck around. Let's talk about finding the overlaps between color pair and archetypes. You may have noticed that when I was going over each color pair that there are a lot of 
similarities between certain color pairs. This is an intentional choice by play design, since having cards that can be drafted in multiple decks makes for a better draft experience. Decks in Abzan colors, green, white, and black, all care about poison counters in various ways, and will thus have a lot of overlap between each other. And in two color decks within these colors, it can even be reasonable to splash for a great card in the third color. Similarly, the blue-green deck can easily support splashing black to synergize with the proliferation or red to synergize with the oil counters. Certain colors, like the red-white equipment deck, don't mesh very well with others. If you draft red-white, do what you can to not splash a third color so you can remain streamlined and consistent in your plan. What about staying single color? There are a few reasons to stay single color in this format. The pool of playable cards is quite deep in most colors, so it's possible to remain in a single color for an entire draft. The main reason to do this would be if you opened a rare that rewards you for being one color. The most notable examples of this are Phyrexian Obliterator and Phyrexian Vindicator, which have highly restrictive mana costs, as well as Koth, Fire of Resistance, which wants you to play as many basic mountains as possible. Part 4 Combat Tricks one of the easiest ways to succeed when playing matches of Limited, especially early on in the format, is to get familiar with the various instants that can affect combat. This includes combat tricks, which either alter the power and or toughness of attackers and blockers, or grant abilities like Death Touch, instant speed removal, which can blow out your double blocks, and flash creatures that can surprise you by blocking out of nowhere. If you don't look at any other cards in one before showing up to Friday Night Magic, one of the best uses of your prep time would be to search the Phyrexia All Will Be One Scryfall Gallery and filter for instant. You can also search for non-instants that have flash by putting Oracle full colon flash in the criteria box. Everything else that your opponents play will be at sorcery speed, so you can read them as they come up. But if your opponent makes a weird attack into your board, knowing what combat tricks they might be holding will make it easier to assign good blocks. Lastly, let's talk about a few of the bombs to keep an eye out for in your packs. There are 10 total Planeswalkers in this set, which is the largest number a single set has had since War of the Spark. This is also the first time we've had Planeswalkers at a rarity lower than Mythic since Core Set 2020. Planeswalkers are generally great and limited, but there are two particularly powerful ones in this set, the Eternal Wanderer and Kaya Intangible Slayer. Part 5. Notable Rares Both of these Planeswalkers have static abilities that make them very hard to remove and powerful loyalty abilities that will take over the game quickly if left unchecked. The Eternal Wanderer is better than Kaya since she costs one less mana and is mono-white rather than both white and black. Either of these cards are slam dunk pack one pick ones though, and at least the Wanderer should probably still be built around if you open her in pack two, even if you aren't already in white. Another cycle of cards to keep an eye out for are the Domini. There's a Diminis in each color, and while some of their static abilities are only good, not great, the fact that they can all become indestructible means that they will be quite strong. The best Domini are the red and green Domini, but any of them would be stellar first picks for your draft. Lastly, I'd like to highlight the newest Sword of X and Y, which in this set is the Sword of Forge and Frontier. This is the red-green sword, and it has an excellent on-hit trigger. Exile the top two cards of your library you can play them this turn, and you can make an additional land drop this turn. Sword of Forge and Frontier is a phenomenal card. Because it's colorless, you can play it in any deck, and the card advantage and protection it offers is invaluable. Just make sure you have enough creatures in your deck if you want to play this card. I'd recommend no fewer than 14, and ideally as many as 17 creatures. And remember that equipment with Fermiridon, as well as any other non-creature spells that generate creature tokens, count toward that creature total. These are just a few of the bombs, but there are a lot more great rares and mythics in this set. 
When in doubt, it's a totally reasonable strategy for new players to simply first pick whatever rare you open and try and build a deck around that card. The information I've covered in this video should provide you with a nice foundation for your first Phyrexia All Will Be One Friday Night Magic draft. But if this topic excites you and you want to be even more prepared for your event, I recommend seeking out a limited set review and reading it over. You can find written set reviews by searching the internet, or you can check out one or more of the premier limited podcasts, such as Limited Resources with Luis Scott Vargas and Marshall Sutcliffe, The Lords of Limited with Ethan Sachs and Ben Wern, or Sam Black's Drafting Archetypes. Links to these podcasts will be listed in the description of this video. And I hope very much this video has been of some help to you. You can help me out greatly by sharing it with a friend, posting it to social media, saying to everyone you know, if you want to draft Phyrexia All Will Be One, this video might be one of the best places to start. next time on Shuffle Up and Play. Today on Shuffle Up and Play, we have each designed a commander deck for one of our friends here at the table. I decided to build a deck that I think that she would really like. Maria, Scholar of Antiquity. Prof, I will give you the option to be intimidating. For my friend, Gavin Verhe. 100 cards, everyone is a secret lair. Uh, Gavin. You're supposed to design for Kibler. New secret layer alert! <laughs> <laughs> so. Can you imagine the Gathering players ask the question? Oh, is this what I'm like? Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> I always have to do it. It's too good! I cannot do it. I'm gonna attack Olivia with Olivia. Or for Lodestone Golem. Why did I put that in there now? Commander Rules Committee plays stacks. How many Pro Tours did you win, Brian Kibler? Two. And how many of those were Commander? All of them. Yes. Okay.